Two words will define your future. Already are. But I or but God. Two words. Two little, but I. But I'm too young. But I don't have a college degree. But I'm a single mother. But I've been divorced. But I don't have the money. But they won't take me. But I, but I, but I. Declaration of your, your, your terrible condition, your limitations. Or, but God, but God can change everything in your life. Stay with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were, uh, were of a noble birth. But God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Why? So that no one may boast in front of him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, because of that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Yeah. Well, a lot of times we, I don't know about you, but I have this sense, I ought to do something, or I have a sense of what kind of person I want to become, but then I get stopped by a single two-word phrase that you get as well, but I, but I. Author Lisa Turkrist writes about that very fact in a very funny way. Here's what she says. I know how to work out and get in shape, but I feel kind of tired. I know it would be great to get into a connect group and form some deep relationships, but I'm kind of introverted. I would love to live relaxed and confident, but I worry. I would love to have my finances in terrific order and to be generous, but I spend too much. I know I should eat kale and, and granola and tofu, but I love butter and sugar and bacon. <laughs> yeah, me too. But I, but I. That's what might be called the defeater belief. It's not just that it keeps me from succeeding at doing what really matters. It stops me and you from even trying. For trying. Think about that. You didn't even give it a shot. You know, well... Why didn't you ask her out? Well, she might have turned me down. Well, you didn't even try. All she could say is, no, you got no going for you already. Why don't you ask her? <laughs> People do this. Why don't you ask for the loan? Why don't you ask to decrease the price? Why don't you step up and be a little bold and aggressive? Why don't you watch that program, Undercover Billionaire, and get some good ideas as a woman or a man how you can take a $100 bill, a used car, and turn it in 90 days into a million-dollar business? And I love it because it's, a, and it's got white and it's got Hispanic and it's got African-American in it, women and men. Yeah. It's a kick in your face to everybody. Well, I, but I couldn't do it, but God wouldn't, but I'm too old, but I, but I'll never find a husband, but I. No, you won't. That, but I ain't going to find anything but a couch, <laughs> okay? So you don't even try. And then I'll never know if I ever could have done it. But I, I can't do it. That little phrase, but I, as it turns out, actually occurs in the Bible a whole bunch of times as the reason or excuse for not doing what God calls somebody to do. God says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. Tell him, let my people go. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Yeah, but you're quick on excuses. Anyway. God comes to Gideon and he says, I want you to deliver my people from the Midianites, but I am the least in my family. God goes to Jeremiah and says, I want you to prophesy, speak my word to my people, but I do not know how to speak. I am only a child and too young. Esther, go to the king and save Israel, but I have not been called by the king for 30 days and he could execute me. If he wants to, Abraham, become the father of a great nation, but I am too old. Peter, cast your net on the other side of the boat, and I'll do a miraculous thing for you. But I fished all night and caught nothing. You getting it? 
over and over and over, we see these pitiful words, but I, but I, but I can't, I shouldn't, they won't, but I. It's very interesting. God pretty much never actually disagrees with any of those statements. I mean, he doesn't say, oh, Moses, you're a pretty good speaker. Uh, Abraham, after all, you're not that old. You're taking supplements. He, he, never, he never disputes their inadequacy, right? We often do. We often engage in what might be called the denial of inadequacy. No, 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 you can do this. You're amazing. That was actually a bit of a technique in the ancient world where Paul was in writing. And we're in this book of 1 Corinthians. And Corinth was really tough on people. It's a competitive culture. It was a startup culture. There was a lot going on there economically. And we've seen there were sayings in Corinth like, only the tough survive in Corinth. Corinth is a place of pressure. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It will eat you up and spit you out. And as it turns out, apparently the people who were part of the church in Corinth were for the most part folks who would have ranked very low on adequacy. They, they were not people who were impressive by Corinthian standards. There was actually uh, ancient advice that said to speakers and writers, if you're trying to win a following or commend yourself or to gain credibility with an audience, one of the techniques you need to be sure to use in Corinth is to throw in some praise for your audience. L let them know that you recognize how intelligent they are, how influential they are, how well-born they are, how well-connected or powerful they are. So with all that as a backdrop, try to imagine how the people in that little church of Corinth must have felt when Paul's letter to them is being read out loud for everybody to hear, and they hear Paul's description, brothers and sisters, think of what you were before you were saved. Not many of you were smart by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. No master's degrees in this crowd. Couldn't even get in a GED. Now, that's an odd way to address a crowd back in Corinth. Paul doesn't start out saying, hey, Corinth, you got it, baby. You got high IQ, high EQ, and a lot of resources, and a lot of connections, and a lot of potential. Corinth, you're killing it. God is so excited to have you on his team. <laughs> God never says that. Instead, Paul actually invites them to reflect on what we might call the review of personal inadequacy. Corinth, wise? Not so much. Influential? Not so much. Well-born? Great gene pool? <laughs> Not really. Paul is incredibly candid about it. He invites them to reflect on that. Then the implication is that, that he draws from this are even more remarkable. He doesn't say, you're not all of that, Corinth, so kind of lower your expectation. Don't dream big. Don't think big. Don't expect to do anything miraculous for God or influential in your world or our world. He doesn't go there. He doesn't say, thank God, a few of you are rich and smart, and we'll build stuff around you. Nope. He says, you, you expect great things now for one reason, because God is up to something that nobody could have anticipated and that nobody could have done but God. But God chose the foolish things. It, it, it could also be foolish ones or foolish people being translated. And he chose the foolish ones to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, now he's quoting from Jeremiah, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Jeremiah had said a long time earlier, don't boast in your riches. Don't boast in your strength. Don't boast in your wisdom. Let the one who brags, brag in the Lord. Now, there are two words that are the turning point of the whole message. They were what changed everything in Paul's life, and they can be the turning point in your life if you want them to be. And these are the two words, but God, but God, but I, but I, Rick, but, I, but God. Paul says, but God is now doing in Corinth with you, you lowly, 
week what God already began on the cross with Jesus. That is overturning human expectations, reversing who matters and who doesn't, elevating the lowly, changing death into life, turning guilt into innocence, taking what the world regards as abject failure and turning it into glorious victory. But God, but God, if you carry nothing away this morning from this message other than that, carry those two words, but God. Take that away and let us all say it together out loud with passion. Come on. But God, good on you. See, but God means this world does not get the last word on who you are or what you become or what you might do. No. This world may say your situation's never going to change. The world may say your lack of education will always embarrass you. That addiction will always enslave you. That depression will always defeat you. That failure will always define you. The past will always haunt you. The future will always frighten you. Your weakness will always, always, always. But God says otherwise. But God begs to differ. But God, that phrase gets used over and over and over in the Bible. But I, but I, but I, I know, I know. But God, but God, but God. Joseph said it to his brothers who for crying out loud sold him into slavery. Years later, when he understood from a different perspective, he said to them, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. And guess what? It did result in great good. The psalmist said, my flesh and my heart may fail, and they will, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Yeah. Jesus said, with human beings, it is impossible. Even salvation is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, but God. Okay, so stop excusing yourself, letting yourself off the hook, waiting on somebody else to do it whining about your own inadequacy and what you can't do and what you don't have. And that gets you out of God's calling on your life. Yeah, great escape clause. But I, but I, but I. We all say it or we feel it, see? I, I know it sounds odd. I just don't know how to put it any other way. God is a lot bigger than your but I. Yeah, he is. Now, of course, look, of course we're not smart enough. Of course, we're not strong enough. Of course, we're not good enough for crying out loud. Who is? But God has chosen the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the meek, the timid, the too shy, the too loud, the not very polished, the not very accomplished, the not very connected, so that whatever is going on in your heart or in your job or with your family or your money or your children or your health, and it looks really, really bad, but God, I tell you, sin, death, pain, and hell, they're real. But they are not final because the power of the cross and the resurrection has not yet finished remaking this sorry, broken, dark world. It's not a but God. Now Paul brings this to Corinth. <laughs> but God, the lowly, not very wise, not very influential. Boy, that's shocking in Corinth. You think San Antonio's tough. Got nothing on Corinth. In Corinth, it was so competitive, slaves would engage in competition with other slaves in the same family to see who looked the most elite, who looked the most impressive, who looked the most accomplished or the most attractive. But God says otherwise about every human being. There's nobody too lowly for him. And this goes way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel when an unlikely character by the name of David is going to be anointed to be king. And God's prophet Samuel went there to Jesse to look at his boys. And at the moment, he only had seven. And they all looked like they ought to be on the front cover of Charisma magazine or some religious magazine or have a great TV. They were handsome. They were just right. They were polished. They just looked the part. Big white teeth. I mean, they just looked like it. I won't go any further. And here's what God says. People look at the outward appearance. Don't they? See, Corinth looks at the outward appearance. Our culture here looks at the outward appearance. What are your degrees? How do you look? Where do you live? What kind of car do you drive? How smart are you? How buff are you? How, how attractive are you? 
you know, it, it, how big is your church? How, how many TV stations are you on? None. Okay. But God looks at the heart. What, what does God see? What does God feel when he looks at a human being, even the most lowly, most uneducated, even the most inadequate? What does God think when God looks at any single human being on planet Earth? Whatever their age, whatever their color, whatever their background, what goes on in the heart of God? How much, you know, I don't know, but how much does every life mean to God? You have to remind yourself of that. What's God doing in the world, you know? Is it just the rich he's interested in? Just the strong, the articulate, the powerful? Now, you might think maybe the church at Corinth had a lot of lowly people who were pretty inadequate, but surely Paul had lots of confidence in his adequacy. He was a brilliant, educated, uh, polylingual man. He, He could speak more than multiple languages. This is where it gets even weirder. Uh, there were other wannabe leaders and self-proclaimed apostles who came to Corinth, and they tried to pull people away from Paul, and particularly the message of a crucified Jesus and the cross. They, they didn't like it that at the center of everything is this great reversal and self-sacrificing love and humility and servanthood. Didn't like that. You know, they, they thought Jesus said, that's greatness. He was turning everything upside down. He was just knocking the heck out of everything Corinth stood for. Now, they weren't into that servanthood and uh, lowly or weak. So they compared their ministry to Paul's ministry. And that's what these kind of wannabe leaders would do. They said they had greater vision. They could work greater miracles. They were perceived to be considerately more eloquent than Paul. And they attracted these great financial backers, sponsors, who gave them all kinds of money. Paul wouldn't even go there. So Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's dealing with that culture to these new Christians in part to try to win them back to the message of the lowly Jesus and the cross. We would expect Paul though, in order to persuade people to follow him and listen to him, to list his credentials and his achievements. Number of souls saved, number of churches started, number of sermons preached, number of converts, number of letters written, number of miracles, because he's writing the New Testament for crying out loud, 75% of it. He doesn't do any of that. What he says to commend himself in Corinth is the oddest thing in the history of human writing. He says, I've been in prison more than you have. (laughs) I've been in prison more frequently. Who brags like that? I've been flogged more severely. Good for you, Paulie. And I've been exposed to death again and again. These are not sources of success or impressiveness in Corinth, in the ancient world. He lists his failures and his problems and his rejections and his humiliations and his being led over the wall in a, of a city in a basket. You know, Rome would honor soldiers when they were laying siege to a city. The first one to get over the wall to face the enemy would get a medal or a promotion. Nobody's getting a medal for being humiliated and kicked out of the city and having to escape in a little basket. No reward for that. So it's a celebration of personal weakness and inadequacy. And it climaxes in this. In order, all that went on, in order to keep me, Paul says, from becoming conceited. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but God doesn't. Now, this is a remarkable statement. Apparently, Paul had some problem with a tendency to get conceited. How many of you wrestle with conceit? Look at that. Nobody. We're all better than Paul. Way to go, Summit. Well, Paul had that problem. And and let me just say, you know, the dude met Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus, pretty pretty impressive, got knocked on the ground, had had, had blinded, had Jesus talk to him for a while. The guy went into the third heaven, was stoned and left for dead. I mean, he writes 75% of the New Testament. Old Peter, who's probably one of the good old boys with eighth grade education, and he said, Paul writes stuff hard to be understood. I said, Paul, they're not doing any better today, Peter. People don't understand it today. It's hard. But you get a, you get a load of what Paul 
might be conceited about. I mean, if I went up to the third heaven and heard sayings that I'm not allowed to talk about and I met Jesus face to face, I might have a problem with overconfidence. I just might. Would you, would you think you just might? Yeah, I don't care how good your prayer life is. I don't care what your spiritual gifts are. You just might strut just a little bit. And so to calm him down, he gets a thorn in the flesh. So it's so bad he's, that he's given this whatever painful or shameful condition. He calls it a thorn in the flesh. And you can bet in every seminary and all theology, they write books and they make all kinds of suppositions about what that might have been, but nobody knows. Okay, that's not really the important issue. Could have been a vision problem. Uh, some folks think he could have had some form of epilepsy. Some people guess because he had been beaten and shipwrecked and had horrible trauma, it might be a form of what we call now PTSD. Maybe Paul was one who suffered from anxiety. We know people said he was not eloquent or impressive in person. Maybe he had a speech defect. Maybe he stuttered badly. Maybe he had a weight problem. But whatever it is, it's a source of ridicule and humiliation and shame for him. And if that's not bad enough that he's conceited and he has some shameful condition, he prays and asks God to remove it and his prayers are rejected three times. Glory to God. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Now, God has a reason for that, okay? It wasn't punishment. The, these other apostles coming to Corinth are strong, successful, eloquent, wealthy, poster boys, boys for God and God's good life. Paul, he's a train wreck, beaten, imprisoned, whipped, tent-making, conceit-prone, thorn-carrying, prayer failure, self-confessed weakling, and God's going to lead with that. Don't you feel better already? Maybe, maybe we'll make it, Yeah. Those are your credentials, Paul. Why on earth would anybody ever talk that way about themselves? Well, run reason in two words, but God. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Well, who talks like that? See, who thinks that way? Who views life like that? Paul, you can't be serious, but he is. What must your view of reality and God be like for you to have the capacity to delight in weaknesses? Because he's convinced with Jesus, everybody has a source of strength outside of yourself, outside of your limitation outside of your weakness. Everybody has a calling, even the most lowly, and everybody has a thorn, even the most exalted. So the question is, are you going to say, but I, but I, but I, are you going to say, but God, yeah. but I can't, or but God can. Yeah. The answer you choose will determine the life you live. Yeah. I, I've been thinking a century and a half ago, it was Jesus. This is not widely known or taught, but his story, his message, and his teaching as Jesus the teacher and his death suffering on a cross and resurrection from an empty tomb. That was at the heart of the greatest catalyst for education on earth. Can I say, in case you're not aware of it, it was Christian money that built the cathedrals all over the earth, all over Europe, all over America, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, were all built by God's money to educate Christian lawyers and missionaries. Now, over the years of I'll Fly Away, we've abandoned education, media, the art, and now they're just institutions of human secularism and humanism, and they're, they don't teach anything about God. But I find it interesting that the education came through Christianity. You won't find that in a pagan world. And then technology and breakthroughs came through Christians through Jesus. The orphanages were started by Christians to start with. Nobody else. They did it. It's amazing what he sp spurred throughout thinking and action throughout the earth just by his teaching and methods and caring for the poor and the outcast. So what if God were to do some new thing here, a spiritual thing? Now, I know, I know our Western culture is famous for skepticism, materialism, secularism, individual, I'm lone star state, individualism, and consumerism, isolationism, and irreligion. I know, I know. 
but God is not done. But God is not willing that any should perish. That's in your Bible too. But God loves San Antonio. But God loves Houston and Dallas and Austin and UT and A&M. I won't get them all, okay. And God chooses the lowly and God chooses the weak and God chooses the poor and God chooses the unconnected. We know this because we're told in the Bible, above all else, Jesus of Nazareth was put to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And by the way, death can't keep its hold on you either. No, but God. It may look bad, it may look over, but God is a resurrection. He loves to raise up dead things. What if we just keep praying and serving and dreaming and asking? See, what if God could move in our church so that one day there would be a thriving campus at Summit? What if we pray to see what God might do through all of us? And imagine 50 years from now, just for a moment, what if 50 years from now people look back on this era we're living in and say, you know, there was a day when the San Antonio area was the most segregated region in the state, but God moved in such mighty ways through his people that now the San Antonio area has a spiritual vitality that rivals its former economic vitality, that now San Antonio is as rich spiritually as it used to be economically. But God, why wouldn't God want that? Why would we not give ourselves wholly to be a part of it? See, when you pray, when you serve, when you give, when you volunteer, when you befriend somebody, when you invite somebody, when you love somebody, when your heart gets broken and your greatest dream dies and you ask God to redeem the suffering and you trust God to give you a new dream that you cannot even imagine, you then become part of the unseen spiritual hinge on which the doors of human history turn. But God, hey, I'm going to give him a chance. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. But God, I'm going to give him a shot. Some of you got the door closed. Give God a shot. You quit too easily. You quit too fast. You got to take pain a little bit longer than average. If you want to break out of your comfort zone and mediocrity, it'll hurt a little more. It hurts a little bit to stay married. <laughs> it hurts to build a great business. It hurts to try to fulfill a dream and a destiny. Pain's part of the process. not permanent or anything, but it's a, it's a, and a lot of people say, well, that hurts. Well, I don't like that. Well, but I, but I, but I. Go ahead, give up, quit. Randy Morrison who's preached here a number of times from Speak the Word Church up in Minneapolis, came to this country with a single mom and $20. And he, he took a job w welding. He said, discrimination, Rick, then was, was terrible. So I made up my mind, I was gonna outwork everybody in the shop, the, the, the steel shop, whatever it was. And, and he said, I did. And I got promotion after promotion. And later God saved him. He became a pastor of a church and went on. But he talked about, I, he said, I wasn't going to let that move me. It was too easy to be better than the average. And I chose I would be that. And he was able to overcome prejudice and limitations and cares for his mom. She's, he moved her to Orlando, bought her a house down there and looks after her while he still runs his church up in Minneapolis. Just one story of many, but he's a close friend, so I know that one well. That's not a long time ago in a far off country. This is real. <laughs> okay. This week, let your words be, but God, not but I, but God. Don't you give up. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop praying. Don't give in to sin. Whatever hurt or heartbreak you're facing, when you feel inadequate, and you will, when you feel uninspired, and you will, or unspiritual, and you will, when you're lonely or confused or frightened, when you know you are not smart enough or strong enough or rich enough, when you feel like a loser nobody, remember, but God, but God. We all have those feelings. We all have those inadequacies, every one of us. You know the reason it took me so long to, be, to become a pastor of a church and start one and leave business? Because I felt inadequate. I, I didn't feel inadequate as a human being. I felt inadequate in this call. But I am not spiritual enough. But I am not religious enough. But I don't want to be like those legalistic, mean, self-righteous people. God, don't do this to me, please. 
I'll support you. I'll, I'll, I'll give vast sums of wealth to support you, God. I mean, anything but this. Uh, well, I lost. And he chose me anyway. So I don't need anybody to tell me, and you don't need anybody to tell you what your limitations are. But God chose the foolish. I hope that somebody will look at me one day and say, well, Lord God, if he can, God can use him, I got it made. Yeah, sometimes it's just like that, you know. But I, or but God, this week, whatever you're facing, but God. Maybe it's a health issue, but God. Maybe it's a family or relational issue, but God. You know, I'm, I'm right out of time, but I have never stopped dreaming. I, I'm excited today as I was when we first started and when we first built this building. But what, what alarms me is that it's, this isn't personal, but it, if you're not careful, it can happen to you where you just become comfortable and complacent and what is, is. But no looking for a better future or tomorrow. I'm, I'm thinking of the church and I'm thinking, it's odd. I was telling Mark Earhart, I said, it's odd. Nobody in all of our years here has ever come up and said, how much does it cost to put an LED screen up there? Maybe I can get a couple of my business guys and we pay for that. Or what's it gonna take for us to get a gym? Well, how much would it take to change that? All kind of levels you can imagine. And I thought, you mean nobody even has a vision? You know, Mark and I bought, bought a couple of tickets for this $850 million Powerball. You can make fun of me till you see what I'm gonna do with it. We sat down, I got a legal pad and I, I paid off this and that and this ministry and that ministry and summit and we've already got the building and I'd have contractors out there on the parking lot right now. I got, I, I'm not satisfied. I, I'm not the, I don't dare want to get comfortable in that dumb cushion seat and say, well, I got AARP. This is about, I got enough to survive. Uh, praise God. Uh, give me a break. That is not going to cut it for me and my household. I hope it won't cut it for you. And maybe you can't do anything right now, but if you become successful and well resourced, we don't, that person's not here anymore, but we, one time, I had one man, and any time I happened to be in his company or at lunch, he would always say to me, Rick, what's the number one need we need right now? How much do we need for it? I'd call Nathan, he said, well, I remember one time it was 45,000 for something. He said, Margie, write me a check, 45,000 to summit. I thought, God, Give us a church full of people like that. Where they initiate, you don't have to beg. Say, what's it gonna to take to fix that, pave that, do that? Can you think that big? Particularly if you're, re if you're resourced, particularly if you're well resourced. Sometimes you just get a group of people together because you're a connector and say, we'll take care of that. Or maybe a single mother has a need or something. Say, we'll take care of that. It's amazing how needs could just disappear. Now, if you don't think any bigger than that and just comfort and good enough is good enough, that's all God will give you. But I think he wants you to want more and, and, and to accomplish more for the sake of his kingdom and, and mankind. Well, that's just my private little peeve I was just sharing with you. That's, that's why I wanted to get off the stage and be in the business world. To say, give me a chance, Lord. People are so bad at doing business, I'll make a fortune. They, it is sucky out there doing business. You can't get anybody to show up. You can't get anybody to follow through. And I'm thinking, walk in a store, can I help you? Well, judging by the sight of you, I'd say probably not. I'll just help myself. Have you ever thought about that? Surely you've had experiences like that. Thank you for watching today's message. Subscribe today to be up to date on all of Pastor Rick's messages. And be sure to visit SummonSA.com for more information.